There, for me, there are sort of three big moments in the writing process. There's getting started, there's getting stuck, and there's getting closure. And I think at least those are thresholds that I think of that every time I write about anything. They are thresholds that I have to manage in some way, psychologically. <laughs> because um, I will say that I'm as afraid of writing as anyone. And writing is hard and scary. And <clears throat> it's scary for a lot of the reasons that Laura just said, which is that you don't know where you're going to end up. And so there is part of the process of getting lost. And that's one of the challenges is not needing to get too coherent too quickly. So, but that scariness is the getting started part. How did you manage that? And the getting stuck is, I think, the most creative moment. We'll come back to it. just when it's getting really bad. You're at the, you're on the breach of victory. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's true. And then getting closure. And how do you, how do you, how do you sort of see the end of the tunnel? So I'm going to do something slightly different, which I, I'm going to read a little bit from the book that I'm now writing. So this is a draft from a draft. And you can think of it, it's a draft of a chapter. Um, and it, when I open it up and read it, I'm still tweaking it. I'm going to present it at a workshop um, two weeks from now at the law school. I'm really nervous about that. And so you're going to see me in action. The book is about revolutionary justice in the French Revolution. And the title of the book is actually The Spirit of Revolutionary Law, uh, found Political Justice and the Logic of Legitimation. And um, the first thing I want to say is that getting started is, writing is a conversation. You don't just write. You write to someone and, or for someone or some group collectively, and you write with people. Because it's, for me, it's both a writing for and a writing with, and we can talk about that problem of audience. And I think an advisor can be either a really enabling or a really disabling audience, depending on your relationship with your advisor, and you can even write against. Um, so, <laughs> but it's most ha happy when it's writing with, in some sense. So it's both for and against. It's a real conversation. So the chapter that I'm going to read from is now currently the first chapter of the book, although it's bounced around. It's been later in the book, it's been earlier. Some books have a clear chronology, they're very narrative, and long writing projects. Some don't. And I've written both kinds. In some ways, chronology is very enabling because it's you can just sort of swim from event to event, and from quote to quote, and you know, it moves along for you once you know what the story you want to tell is. But this is a more analytic book. And the chapter is called Tribunals, and it's about the creation of the French Revolutionary Tribunal, which is in some sense the first political tribunal. So the writing with start begins that I, I, I have two epigrams, so that are in some sense things I'm in conversation with. And the first one is from a very famous French philosopher, Montesquieu, and his Spirit of the Laws. And it says, the power to judge should not be given to a permanent Senate that it should be exercised, the power of judgment, by people taken from, uh, by, by persons taken from the body politic as a whole, from the people, so from the body of the people. So it should be democratic, that the power to judge should be democratic, it shouldn't reside in an aristocratic or senatorial body. That's the first quote. The second quote is, à la lanterne, to the lynching post, which is a proverbial, um, uh, uh, quote used in popular riots uh, and, 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 and political lynchings. Mm. So those are the two quotes, um, these two ideas of popular justice that I want to capture in the opening of this book. So here goes a little bit, and I'll give, I'll try and do about 10 minutes, and you'll see who else I'm writing with. Hannah Arendt famously contrasted a relatively peaceful American Revolution with an extremely violent French one. This French penchant, or penchant, for mixing politics with blood was, she explained, was explained, she suggested, by the greater social inequalities to be found in old regime France than in the young British colonies in North America. In France, as a consequence, 
democracy came with a tragic imperative to produce greater socioeconomic equality, an imperative from which the Americans were blissfully exempt, channeling our there. That's your great thesis. It, the social imperative in France resulted in the repressive class warfare of the year two, in some in the terror. We now know, however, that the purportedly greater violence of the French Revolution, both among revolutions and in comparison with preceding or succeeding civil wars, was in fact an illusion. The middle, military casualties of the American Revolutionary War, 1775 to 83, were about 25,000 men. That is to say, 12.5% of all servicemen. Um, who totaled 200,000, and about 1% of the total population of the North American colonies in 1780, about 2.7 million people. The American Civil War of 1860-65 left a slightly higher level of military casualties, 1.2% of the population. Though no accurate figures are available and estimates vary widely, a reasonable approximation of combined military and civilian casualties from the French Revolutionary Wars of the First Coalition between 1792 and 97, roughly the same number of years, and the Civil Wars of the year two, 93-94, together reached about 350,000 people, or about 1.3% of the French population. In other words, the percentage of the population killed during the American Revolution was, conservatively, about the same as during the French Revolution. And in fact, it was probably significantly higher in America because the French estimates include civilians and the American ones do not. There is ample qualitative evidence of widespread vigilante justice during the American conflict, including the use of terroristic t terrorist tactics, such as targeting of civilians, the destruction and appropriation of property, lynching, and rape. Thus, the French Revolution was, quantitatively, a no more and probably significantly less violent affair than its sister revolution across the Atlantic. This illusion of greater violence in Fran revolutionary France, however, the guillotine, was not accidental, nor was it simply a prejudice of the revolution's enemies and detractors. It is an illusion that was created consciously by the French revolutionaries themselves. The French did not seek to kill more of their enemies than necessary. In fact, one could argue to the contrary. They sought rather to ensure that the death of each one of them would have maximal symbolic impact. The special French predilection was not for violence. It was for the ritualization of violence. The essence of the French terror was the use of violence for symbolic rather than instrumental aims. Terror is the tactic of an enemy who perceives himself or herself to be the weaker party. And that was not irrationally the perception of those French revolutionaries who for the most part came from the middle and the lower classes and who found themselves at war simultaneously with the most powerful and privileged within their own society and with the greatest powers of Europe. Terror was a political and military strategy that meant to lend, lend maximum symbolic visibility to revolutionary violence. Terrifying violence, however, can take many forms, and the French terror took a particular one. The most the specific form of its ritualization was, in essence, juridical. What distinguishes the violence of the French Revolution among world historical revolutions is not the higher body count. It is the ubiquity of political tribunals. In 1861, Beria de Saint-Prix, the first scholarly student of revolutionary justice, estimated that beyond the great revolutionary, revolutionary tribunal in Paris, there were at least 144 other exceptional tribunals, of which about 60 were military, popular, or revolutionary commissions. The Harvard scholar, Donald Greer, more recently was able to document a total of about 150. All but one of the departmental regular criminal tribunals, the Nieve was the happy exception, at one time or another had adopted exceptional procedures similar to those used by the Paris Revolutionary Tribunal. In all, 
Jacques Gauchot estimates, following Greer, that approximately 800,000 Frenchmen and women were detained or s for suspected counter-revolutionary crimes. About 17,000 were tried and condemned to death, and perhaps another 10 to 12,000 were executed without trial. Finally, another 5 to 10,000 died in prison or by other means. Thus, somewhere along the lines of 35 to 40,000 people, 7 to 8 percent of all detained as counter-revolutionaries, met with death by juridical means or while under detention. Scroll forward. Significantly, as Donald Greer demonstrated, only about 1.25% of those condemned were charged with economic crimes, i.e. with socio socioeconomic crimes, counterfeiting, fraud, profiteering, misuse of public funds. And while the social distribution of the victims of the tribunals was heavily biased toward the higher social orders and classes, nobles, priests, and the wealthy, the repression was predominantly motivated at least as consciously articulated in prosecutorial indictments by political rather than socioeconomic exigencies. In other words, it wasn't class warfare per se. Political tribunals, as, a, as opposed, for example, to scorched earth, the targeting of innocence, ritualized mutilation, or rape, were weapons meant to compensate less for military weaknesses than they were intended to address the political weakness of a, regi of a regime that had yet to find a stable constitutional foundation. There was a social message propagated by the political tribunals of the revolutionary period, a point to which I will return late, at length in a later chapter. But it was less the message of class warfare than one of radical egalitarianism. And not surprising, the, this message of egalitarianism met with greatest political resistance from the most privileged within French society. To paraphrase Clausewitz, the tribunal was politics by other means. Close assessment of both the aims and the dynamics of the tribunals leads us away from the purely instrumental interpretation of revolutionary justice, espoused most persuasively by Albert Matiez as either class warfare or national defense. I'm not going to go on because I'd like to have some time for you. 